All right, Shalom Aleichem Alemen. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Yiddish Celebrity Series. My name is Jana mazurkiewicz Meisarosz, and I'm the founder of the Yiddish Arts and Academics Association of North America, based here in San Diego. And it's a big honor and pleasure to host Hershey Felder today. Most of you probably know him already from the screen or from the stage. Uh, so I don't have to tell you much about him. He is a famous actor and uh, pianist, performer, and he uh, brightened our Magaife Zeiten, our um, pandemic days with his magnificent music. Uh, so uh, today I hope that we'll learn more about him. So my first question is, um, about your roots, so probably our Yiddish speaking audience <laughs> or people who are interested in the Yiddish language, even if they don't speak it, would like to learn about your childhood, about the household you grew up in. Could you please tell us more about it? And you have to unmute yourself. Because we... Oh. There we go. How's that? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank you. I, forgive me, I thought I was unmuted. Well, nice to meet everybody, a pleasure. Mm -hmm. I'm you from Florence, Italy, in fact, where I live. Uh -huh. and, um, we're not very many people speak Yiddish, but there's a lovely Jewish community and a beautiful school. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a um, Polish and Hungarian home. My parents were both uh, survivors themselves. My father from Poland, he was born in Ustritsky, and my mother was born in Budapest, but she came only in 56. So she came 10 years later, well, she was 10 years old. And, um, and my uh, father came just during the war, but everybody else in the family, except for the immediate family, perished in Auschwitz. So um, I grew up in uh, what would be called a religious uh, modern Orthodox home, uh, as much as it could be in those days. I was born in 1968, so it still was 23 years after the end of the war, but I grew up in a very, very Yiddish home. Um, we spoke Yiddish at home. Uh, of course, we, we went to shul, so I spoke Hebrew, and I went to Hebrew school, so I spoke Hebrew. And I um, uh, was also part of the Yiddish theater in Montreal. I grew up doing Yiddish theater. So to me, Yiddish is a part of my, and I spoke Yiddish from my grandparents. So um, I grew up in a very Yiddish world, but also Montreal was a very Yiddish world to begin with you know, Yiddish was being taught in school still in the, in the J Jewish people's in Parrot school. Yiddish was taught as part of the education. Many people grew up speaking Yiddish. And in fact, Montreal was one of the communities that didn't um, North Americanize so quickly. We stayed very much so European. And I essentially grew up in a European household, which is why I feel very comfortable here at home in Europe, especially among Europe Jewry who has stayed here. That makes sense. And uh, was there any mishmash when it comes to dialects in your house? Well, yes, of course, the Hungarian spoke with a very Hungarian accent and my right. father spoke with an ap the absolute pure Polish Yiddish. Um, and I, because I was in Yiddish theater, was was uh, performing in a Stanislavski Yiddish, so a very Litvish Yiddish. Right. So I actually <laughs> spoke all three, you know, I can do all three, it's less dialects than it is accents, you know, gotcha. I mean, Hungarian is a world of its own, it's got, it's got its <laughs> own very, very funny, you know, Yiddish expressions, but the rest were all very cleanly Polish and, and Litvish Yiddish that I spoke and uh, studied and uh, performed in even when I was a kid. So yes, and I grew up also from, so I grew up mm -hmm. observant up until up until a little bit later when I was 17 or 18 and went off on my own and as an artist, I uh, went to shul every weekend and spoke Yiddish all the time. So yeah. I was about to ask, how did you feel with this from kite? Was it, was it comfortable? Was it, or was it rather a burden? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask because I have always viewed myself in, as a bad Jew because I know what it means to be a good Jew. Um, and um, it took a while to understand that who I am is okay the way I am because I am obviously don't keep Shabbos now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's here, it's over, you know, it's late mm -hmm. at night, it's 8 o'clock at night, but I don't keep. Shabbos and I had my first shrimp when I was 18 years old and that was a whole discovery on its own but um, 
you know, crossing the line of what's okay and what's not okay. I grew up wearing a yarmulke. I wore, grew up wearing a kippah. Mm -hmm. I grew up identifying that. But the thing is, I didn't change my attitude or my um, my sense of being Jewish. As many people know, you've all seen me in my Jewish plays. And one of the things people say is, oh, you know, one of the things we're so proud of is you don't pretend you're not Jewish or pretend you're half Jewish or pretend you've disappeared. No, I'm very much so. I'm not observant the way I was when I grew up, but I'm very much so a Jewish person who presents himself as a Jewish person. And, you know, it's funny. Well, I don't know that it's funny. Nothing about it is funny. But, um, yeah. Uh, up until, you know, last week or two weeks ago, I've been talking about what America is made up of in terms of anti-Semitism and so on. And because I've been so Jewish on the stage, everybody would say, oh, but, you know, it's not an issue here. Well, surprise, it's an issue here in America, you know. I mean, look what we saw in Capitol Hill in terms of, in terms of blatant anti-Semitism. So I think... Um, it's ve I'm very proud to be Jewish, and I always have been, and I'm not ever going to pretend, but sometimes, you know, especially here in, well, I grew up in Quebec also, so that was highly anti-Semitic. But here in Europe, you encounter, I mean, one of the encounters I had when I was first, when I first moved to Paris or France was, uh, but you're Judeo-Christian. I said, no, I'm Jewish. No, 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 you're too nice. You have to be Judeo-Christian. I said, no, I'm Jewish, you know, the old guys. Um, and they couldn't grasp that. It was too difficult to grasp that somebody would want to be that or that somebody who is decent could be that. Or it's very strange. When I was in, Mar I went to school, I went to from school and then after you graduate and you go to uh, college. And I went for six months to Marianopolis in Montreal before I, um, before I actually went to McGill and just stayed at McGill and studied music. And one day in class, one of the, um, I was 16, one of my neighbors is, is pushing on my head. And I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for the horns. I said, oh, come on, you can't be serious. He said, no, where are they? I said, you've got, what are you talking? You know, so this was, you know, if we're aware of it, this is what we grow up around. This is what we know, but I never, I was never uh, ashamed or shy or pretend that I wasn't, never. I've always been very, very Jewish. And I'm not sure why, you know, I always felt so committed to that, except that I am. And I grew up in a rabbinic family. My uncle was a head rabbi of Toronto. So I've never, I've never been anything but very Jewish and very Yiddish because of where I came from, which was different from all of my, um, how do you call it, my classmates' experience, most of them, None of their parents had been born in, in Europe. I think my parents in my entire class were the only ones who were born in Europe. Everyone else was born in Canada or America or some grandparents, yes, but not parents. Yeah, that was my other question. Did you feel isolated in school because of that? No, I always had a big mouth and I was a big performer. <laughs> isolated, no, but you know, I had, there was two sections, but again, I, I grew up in Montreal. So we had Sephardis, we had Moroccans, we had, uh, you know, I was the European faction. We had many factions. So it wasn't, you know, it was when I went to summer camp because I went to summer camp in America. I went to Morosha and it was there where I felt different, not in a bad yeah. way. I just felt I came from Europe because Americans had a way of Americanizing for the most part, especially these guys. Some of these kids, their great grandparents were American, you know, so uh, certainly not their grandparents. They came way before. So all this to say that um, I never felt isolated. No, I mean, I always got on it, but I always felt I had something special. I had something a little bit more, maybe so less isolated than it was. Um, advantaged, I think. Mm -hmm. I see. So in America, you felt different in what way? Can you describe? Well, I, I didn't feel different. I felt very much so the same. But the experience that I had was a very different experience than most American young Jews because, you know, but then again, the ones that I knew, because depending on where you went, you experienced something different. America also is a very different place in that Canada, where I grew up in Montreal, celebrated the differences, whereas in America, you really did want to be an American, you know, it was very much so, certainly then, certainly 
in the 1970s and 80s, you know, being an American was being an American. Um, and, uh, you know, and of course, I've lived many years in America and feel very much so a big part of my soul is American, although it's not where I come from. So all this to say that I, I've never felt isolated. I've never felt, you know, that unable to communicate. But what I have felt is just a little bit different. And for me, that's always been okay. That's actually never been a problem for me. Gotcha. When it comes to food in your house, did uh -huh. you eat any traditional Yiddish dishes? Well, given that I, most of my time was always having to get bigger pants and bigger clothing. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> it, it was a regular, a regular, you know, both Hungarian and, and Polish and very Jewish and very Eastern European. That's what we grew up eating. Yes, absolutely. Now, of course, you had hot dogs during the week and you had pizza during the week and you had salads and, you know, but also... I mean, when I was a kid, it was the 70s and just the beginning of the 80s. We still weren't, you know, internationally food conscious and so on. I mean, I grew up with the, the kosher bakery and the kosher, you know, prepared foods and so on and so forth. And most of the food that I grew up with, the dishes were either Hungarian or Polish. That's what I grew up with. And it's interesting because I have that tradition. Now, all my friends in Europe and all my friends in America love when I cook traditional Hungarian and Polish Jewish food. I mean, they can't move after the meal. That <laughs> happen. But other than that, they they really enjoy that. So awesome. So what can you you can even cook it? I did not expect that. That's already a higher level. <laughs> no, it's not at all. But it was very much so a thing. A lot of people know that about me. That I like I like feeding people. What is your uh, special dish that you give? to your friends. Well, well special is there's nothing special. Everything, <laughs> pardon me, is special. But the one I love the most that I prepare for people because I love it and eating it as leftovers, I mean, is mm -hmm. just the best thing in the world any day. And that's kapasta tsvekerli, which is Hungarian for fried cabbage and noodles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's the best. And whenever people say, what? Oh, that's going to be <laughs> terrible. And then I give it to them. And here in Italy, I make my own homemade noodles, which is a big thing. You know, I make the pasta, or as we call it, the nocedli, or the noodles. And they go crazy. They can't stop eating it. I introduced this dish to the Italians, and they love it so much. So, yeah. Wow. So what, what were your career plans when you were a kid? Did you think about maybe having a restaurant? <laughs> or you always wanted to become a musician? I was always a performer, storyteller, musician, always since I was a child. I didn't know that that's what I would end up doing because, you know, a good Jewish boy doesn't do those things. But exactly, I, I, knew, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so I uh, and I was in the Yiddish theater from the time I was 13. So, you know, and also concert piano from the time I was 10. So all of this together, I, I this is what I did. Well, so you're probably uh, probably your family. Uh, was not too excited with your career choices or it's what, not that they were excited they were very very supportive because I was doing mm -hmm. this very young I think it just came to the point where nobody was sure what I was going to do and you know you always worry can you make a living I did okay it's fine but um you know my father still worried he says so you're making a living of yeah that it's okay we're, we're oh he's fine. swearing <laughs> I see <laughs> It's very cute. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you do, they worry, you know. For sure, for sure. Uh, we have some uh, questions from the audience members, sure. but maybe we can wait for them until the end of the interview. Is it okay? And the one person is already asking uh, you why you are not you doing it in Yiddish. So maybe one day we can do it in Yiddish. <laughs> that would be... Any, anything you want, even in Yiddish, it's not. <laughs> well, today we promised answer, English. So. I won't answer in Yiddish so that everybody can understand, but I'm happy to take the question in Yiddish. Sure. Great, great. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, yes, let's go back to the Yiddish theater. I'm curious whom you met there, what were your experiences? Um, including um, good ones and bad ones <laughs> well there's nothing bad about any of it i my you know i uh went to the Yiddish theater of montreal when i was very young dora wasserman was the director um and she of course was a student of michols who was a student of stanislavsky so it was the real russian tradition of of uh, the moscow yiddish art theater the real true russian tradition and 
I think other than doing the plays that I did, I did was a musical director and actor in the very first international completely Yiddish fiddler on the roof, which was a fiddler in Dach. I translated a lot of, of pieces and translations. I um, directed music for a lot of things. I uh, performed as a kid. Um, I was in, I think I was 13 or 14 years old and I was in, um, I was in an Isaac Bashevis P Isaac Bashevis singer piece, and Isaac Bashevis came to uh, Montreal because I, I think it was friends with Thor. I don't remember what it was, but we were doing his piece, and he came and stayed at my house, which was a very exciting thing to have Bashevis in my house as a young person. And he really looked like a, an angel devil. He was really quite something. He looked, he looked like a human version of Gollum in the in the. Um, you know, who looks for the ring. He was a fascinating man, but so funny. Uh, it was a uh, um, Shlemiel, Shlemiel der Erste. I did Shlemiel the first, um, and I played one of the rabbis in that, and I remember that, and then I played in Lies My, Liegens was mein Tatot mir gesucht, which was Lies My Father Told Me, and I played in Ellis Island. I played a whole bunch of things, and then I did The Fiddler on the Roof, and then when I came to New York, the first thing I did was Stampin' You with um, Mina Bern and David Rogoff and Tsipora Speisman and all these people, you know, uh, and folks be now on 55th Street in New York in the basement where the theater was. So I've had great Yiddish theater experiences. I've always felt very close to the Yiddish theater. A lot of my comedy, of course, is born from that kind of style of storytelling. So uh, tell us uh, more about your first experiences uh, in America. In America, <laughs> you see, I'm already Yiddishizing <laughs> the interview. Um, in America, and how Yiddish theater or how performances, how the way of acting, directing was different here than in Canada, if you noticed any differences. Not in the Yiddish theater. In the Yiddish theater, it was. The Zelda Mishigas that it was mm -hmm. in Canada. And Mishigas is basically a, a, uh, a completely fair description. It, you know, it was a big family that got on each other's nerves everywhere you went, but uh, was good that I was a very serious artist and we took it seriously and we did it seriously. The one thing that was, was important to us that it always had to clink the noia. It always had to be real Yiddish. It couldn't be that's speaking like, you know, I mean, red and the agoy is knit get that kind of thing didn't work. So it always had to be a real, especially where I grew up, a real Litvish or a real Polish Yiddish. And because my father was a real Polyak, a real, a real, real Yiddishist who still speaks beautiful, perfect Yiddish. It was um, a very important thing that, you know, I spoke for real and the way it's the way it's supposed to be. And then I met so many wonderful people in New York. I met Hanan Mlotek, I met Zalman Mlotek, who were, and then I met all the gang from Yivo. And, uh, you know, a lot of people that I was with in Yiddish in the old days. I uh, met uh, the Sylvia Elstein, who was the widow of Abraham Elstein, who composed all those wonderful songs from Ali Pekan. That whole world, I did evenings of Yiddish, and some of those actors and artists came to me and I met them. Um, God, it's a long time ago. It's 30 something years, of 30, 30 years ago, where all these people, who came to me and I would host events in my house, all of the Yiddishists in New York, the Yiddish, famous Yiddish actors from the old days. And it was wonderful to be with them. I haven't, you know, I mean, most, they're all gone, but it was wonderful to be a part of that generation of the real, the last generation of real Yiddish actors from after the war. They were wonderful. What do you think? Is there any hope for Yiddish, for Yiddish theater, for Yiddish culture and language? Well, you know what I, Bashevis said, if Yiddish is dying, it should die this way another thousand years, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and and it, it's, it's, it's of, course, of course, there's hope. And I think, you know, when America, America is gonna see and the world's gonna see that there is a huge force of anti-Semitism, I think the resurgence will be important. Um, it was always interesting to me that so many who went to Israel, especially from my family, they shunned Yiddish for so long. 
And then it became, you know, what you spoke, uh, you know, in the Frumish Tettles or, you know, in upstate New York or, you know, by the, by the uh, Hasidim that you spoke Yiddish. But other than that, um, Yiddish was something that I think people are finding again and finding how delicious and wonderful it is. And, you know, so much of the comedy that we see in America is born from that kind of Yiddish culture and other cultures. But, you know, there was a whole a whole period of time where all this kind of comedy was Yiddish. That's right. So tell us more how you ended up doing what you're doing. Um, In general? Yes. I mean, what was the path uh, to the great composer series and uh, all of that? Well, you know, needing to pay rent is always a <laughs> um, But really, the the situation was very much so that I was a musician, I was an actor, and I had to find a way to mix these things. And everybody said I was crazy, and I, so I took on Gershwin, and it grew out of there. It's you know, it's not anything that you plan. I didn't make this grand plan. The grand plan that I have had was that I wanted to be able to create a, um, a life in the arts and life in storytelling. That was absolutely the case. But to be able to do and imagine what it is I'm doing and live overlooking mm -hmm. Cuomo in Florence and in Paris, I mean, that, no. <laughs> um, that, you know, none of that. It was all part of a dream, but I didn't know how I'd get there. And then eventually it starts to unfold. And if you pay attention, the doors that open for you, you, you figure out which ones to go through. Mm -hmm. And with the movies, the idea of the movies, did it come to you because of the Magaifa, because of the cholera, <laughs> or it's... Uh, it's uh, cholera. It's, yeah. the, uh, <laughs> but it came to you independently and the cholera just came. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, where are you from, if you don't mind me? Are you Polish? Poland, Poland, yes. But where in Poland? Kielce, of all places. Mm -mm. I spend a lot of time in Warsaw and, uh, mm -hmm. and also in Krakow, you know, but that's because of Chopin more than anything. Um, but um, in terms of the movies, they were always planned and people were always mm -hmm. asking, when are you doing the movies? When are you doing this? I said, 10 years, when I'm dead, I'll do this. <laughs> Um, and then all of a sudden COVID happened, the Magaif, as you say, happened. <laughs> it's funny, I haven't thought of it to call it a Magaif, but yeah. the Magaif <laughs> happened and, um, <laughs> and uh, theaters were all of a sudden desperate and people were desperate and they said, how do we continue this? And I was one of the first who came up with the idea, we're going to do this like movies. We're going to do this properly. We'll do this live. I'll do it from where I am. Couldn't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I will see what happens. In the beginning, I was going to go to a theater in America and do them all from there. That, that would have been ridiculous. So all of a sudden, this happened, and it took off with the Berlin, the Irving Berlin piece, and they start to fly. And I said, OK, I guess this is something. And then I realized this is a business. It's like, it's like with all the other things. You walk through the door, and the real concept was to look after people and help with theaters and help with my staff. Because as many people know, the alternative was very much so to um, fire everybody and take two years off and wait for it to end and so on. And I, I couldn't do that. There was something that was driving me to make sure that the people who have cared for me and cared about me for all these years somehow uh, were taking care of during this terrible time. It would be a terrible, terrible thing uh, to just say it's not my problem anymore. So I made it my problem, and out of that was born <clears throat> Trump produces these movies. And uh, yes, let's uh, tie it now to Sholem Aleichem movie. Tell us more about the production process and where the idea of the Sholem Aleichem movie came from. The idea of the Shalom Aleichem movie came because I've always wanted to do this character, but I didn't know when or if and, you know, and how. And I, I thought about it for years. And in fact, in the old days when I was thinking about it, I had helped a friend of mine create a piece about Shalom Aleichem, which was Theodore Bekel, who I was very close with, um, created uh, something about Shalom Aleichem. And his uh, story about Shalom Aleichem was about Shalom Aleichem, but it ended up being about him and creating the role of Tevye, which is perfect for him, but that wasn't for me because although I've played it in, you know, school productions and in my grown-up life, I never played Tevye, although I'd, love, I'd like to because it's, it's a very much so a role for me. So I, um, 
I thought about maybe creating it one day and I put it at the back of my mind. And when I was here um, seven months ago, I guess, I just after the Magefa started, um, I met Igor Polositsky, who is a Ukrainian um, of or Ukrainian origin, who's a, a violist and violinist in the Madra Musicale, which is the main orchestra here. It's the main philharmonic here in, in this part of Italy, in Florence. And in a conversation, out comes from him, you know, I have this klezmer or a group that we've been playing together for 15 years. We play all over the world and so on and so forth. But we play the real traditional klezmer, not the American style klezmer. And uh, we should do something together sometime. Ta -ta 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 -ta. And all of a sudden, I was so struck by their music and by this gang that I said, and they're all first chairs in the symphony, that I said, well, why don't we do something? I think I have an idea. You know, I'm doing a lot of these composers, but one of the stories I really want to tell is that of Shalom Aleichem. I have an idea in my head of how to do it, so I think I'm going to do it. And that's how it happened. And then I just said it as part of the season, and poof, here we are in production for Shalom Aleichem or before Fiddler, which is fun. Yes, yes, yes. It's very nice to explore what before Fiddler times of Shalom Aleichem, for sure. Is there any Yiddish in the movie? Uh, well, the whole thing is kind of Yiddish, but in terms of actually extended Yiddish, not so much because you want the public to understand. But remember the important thing about Shalom Aleichem. He said that his story should be read and told in any language that is that is comprehensible. So it's not just about the Yiddish itself, but it's the character of Yiddish and not just the Yiddish, the language. And so, I mean, I could do it in Yiddish and chances are at some point in my life I will, but it would actually be a lot of fun in Yiddish because it's fun. I think you should and then, you know, there are always uh, subtitles. Yeah, you but can I mean, the essentially, but, but for now, but for now I'll do it in English so the general audience can understand because you have to eat, right? We understand that. <laughs> well, you know that, and, and because it's, it's a good story to tell in English. For sure. Uh, tell us, uh, to change the topic a little bit, how did you meet your wife? I was giving a concert in Los Angeles 29 years ago, and I was asked to play in her honor. She had just left after being prime minister. Um, I guess I played well. That's right. And um, then how did it, what happened later? I had 28 years, so a lot of my whole adult life. Um, yeah, that's how we met. She was a consul general after being prime minister and I played in her honor. We became very close friends very quickly. And after about eight months, we decided this was the way we wanted our lives to go. And so we've been together ever since. So and a lot has happened, you know. Um, Kim has taken on lots of projects and she's had the very difficult schlep of coming to see me, you know, when mm -hmm. she's on one project and I'm on stage for eight weeks. But we always, it's never more than 10 days or 12 days that we were separated. But, you know, it was a lot of schlepping for her. So this is really the first time where neither of us have to schlep in 28 years. Okay. The beginning, yes. <laughs> the, be the beginning was quite. The beginning was quite stable. The first three or four years, we were both in Los Angeles, working in Los Angeles. But after that, it became not challenging because you just do it, but a schlep. You're constantly going. You know, you're five minutes at home and then you run again. And and so this is. I have to tell you, it's one of the very strange, strange gifts that COVID gave people like me and a lot of other people is the ability to spend time with their families that, you know, life is coming and going. Now, would we have liked to do that without the terrible tragedies that are happening? Absolutely. But it imposed, you know, being together, not just us, but many families um, on a lot of people. And a lot of people are very happy. You know, I have artist friends who talk about never in their 30, 40 year marriages were they together for that long. And you saw, I mean, the sad thing is if you're together and then you realize you really don't like each other. But the good news is if you are together and you discover that you really do like each other, then it's a really nice thing to have confirmed and to be together. So there's a little bit of that blessing. There's also the very strange silver lining is that for the first time in my adult life, 27 years, my suitcase is unpacked and put in the closet. In 27 years, 
I never, and, and I realized it only about, you know, six months ago, I knew when I, I realized I was staying, I never unpacked my suitcase. 27 years, it would come and it would sit on the floor in the corner, either in the hotel I was staying or the Airbnb or whatever it was, or on the floor at home because it was going on to the next place. And, you know, you just take it out, you do the laundry and leave whatever you don't use in there. And, and the, con the suitcase is unpacked. I wouldn't even know where to find it. It's somewhere. Um, and I'm, that part of me is very happy, I must admit, is that it was, it was an exhausting life and I feel better. I'm not always as tired, although I'm tired, but not always as tired. I'm sure you have reasons to, to be tired. You work yeah, very I work hard. Nonstop. Yeah, I do work nonstop, yes, that's true. But don't you miss that uh, traveling and being on no. stage? No. Really? Not even being on stage? <laughs> No, I'm, I am on stage because a lot of what I'm doing is on stage filmed and so on and so forth. Do I miss the live audience? You know, not in the way that you say, oh, I miss something. It's, it's a very big part of my life, but it's always been a part of my life. So, you know, I, it's hard to say, oh, I need the audience or I can't live. No, you know, the audience is a wonderful thing, but it's also a job. And, you know, the audience is great on one night, but then you have eight nights, almost 11 months of year. It's a profession. The important thing, it's not just about getting applause. It's actually being responsible for your audience. And your responsibility is huge, it's huge, huge, huge. So um, this is kind of nice in that form. Yes, yes, I can imagine that. Somebody asked, do you have any children? No, I don't have it. We decide, we have a dog. We have a beautiful <laughs> dog. He is our second. He is the nephew of the first dog we had, but um, his name is Leo. <laughs> Leo, Leo, our standard poodle. And he's just such a good friend, Leo, and great companion. Um, but no, we don't have children. We decided early on that that was not in the cards for the live lives that we were leading. Oh, yes, I can imagine. And does your wife speak any Yiddish or understand any Yiddish? She does. Strangely, before me, I always say she was getting prepared for me. Her first husband was Yiddish speaking, Tuzi Davinsky. And uh, so she speaks actually quite a bit of Yiddish. Absolutely. Do you, do you talk to each other in Yiddish sometimes or mostly in English? No, in English. But... Um, but, you know, if something expressive comes out, of course, Yiddish is always fine. It sounds good. So why did you choose to live in Europe? Well, I always wanted to, I'm very European by nature because one, I grew up in Montreal and I grew up with languages and languages, but also it's what I do. What I do is very much so European based because the composers are, even though I did American composers, you know, a lot of my work, originated here in these parts of the world and also why to choose to live in Europe why because Florence is so ugly <laughs> you know I mean it's it's the best of most wonderful worlds it was really for retirement but you say why did I choose to live in Europe it's only because of, of COVID that I'm living in Europe home was always here but it was for when I retired it wasn't for I mean, I was on stage if I was at home four weeks out of the year it was a lot I was mostly on stage, just performing in parts of the world for five, six, seven, eight weeks, and then two days and another eight weeks somewhere else and another character in two days and another eight weeks somewhere else. So it was consistent um, on that level. It was endless, endless travel. Europe was always home in my heart, the way I felt it. And this was an opportunity to be here. So here I am. Okay, and how does it feel to live in such a small place as compared to the vast, vastness of Canada or California? It's a completely different lifestyle, right? Well, you know, Florence is like a village. Even exactly. Paris is like a village. Paris is a very big village. It's huge. Paris is huge. Florence is like a village, but it's an international village. Well, less now because we don't have tourists, but you know, it's very, there's an international community here and uh, there's an Italian community here and it's, it's, uh, it's home for me. It's strange because it's very much, so, you know, and the Italians are a lot like the Jews, you know, come over and you eat, that's what happens. That's just, just the rules, you know, what are you supposed right. to do? Breathe. Um, 
So you recognize, you recognize that very much so that an Italian table is very much so like a, a, Jew, a Jewish table. And um, it's familiar, but it's also the center of art and the Renaissance. I mean, the most beautiful things are here. So I'm not sure what small really means. And Italy is not exactly small, you know, um, it's big. Yeah, so, what I mean is like, you know everybody probably. You no, there are a lot of people I don't. A lot of people I don't know, but I do know a lot of people. Everybody knows everybody. So you always know somebody who knows somebody. But isn't there a wonderful charm, you know, for that? It's so wonderfully charming to be able to talk, go to lunch with somebody and see somebody. It's very, very sweet. But it still is. A, it's a city. I mean, it's not. You know, it's not a village. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a city. That's right. Okay, uh, I see people have lots of questions, so maybe we can open the floor for the questions. Uh, Debbie, could you unmute, please? Because yeah. I saw you have, okay. Yeah, awesome. sorry. Oh, I have so many questions, I'm sorry. I don't want right. to monopolize his time because um, I want him to cook for us when he comes back to San Diego. We got to figure out something. Sweet. I know you did it with, was it with Debussy? You did it. Did no, not, not San Diego. San Diego never had WC. San Diego. I, I cooked. We, no, we no, no, no. I meant online. There was a yes, special we did a, thing. We did, a cook, we did a cooking show for you yeah. for WC. That's correct. But um, I have cooked, let me see, in various theaters as benefits. Oh, no, I have done it in San Diego a couple of times. For San Diego Rep, I've done okay. three or four dinners, and they charge a lot of money for yeah. you to eat my dinners. <laughs> let's, let's do it. How about, can you make kreplach and uh, gefilte fish? Of course, except my gefilte fish is not like the old style. My gefilte fish was actually taught to me by my grandmother um, in, a, in a tomato sauce, believe it or not, oh. rather than in a standard, and it's very beautiful. It's, you know, I, it's funny, it was Hungarian, the Hungarian style gefilte fish, and it's really beautiful, really beautiful. So my, my friends who eat my gefilte fish really like that. Oh, wow. Let's do that, Yana, when he comes back. Yes. It, organization. Of, co be, that, of course. Really it, cool. it, uh, it did cross my mind to ask. Yes. I will <laughs> buy a ticket. I will buy a ticket. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Nice to see you again, Hershey. We've met and see, I'm an usher here. So we've met before. I don't know. At, if the, you rep, at the rep or the old globe, which theater are you at? All of them. I do them yes. all, and I've seen every production you've ever done in San Diego, <laughs> and I, I bought the package, so... Um, so you'll see all the stuff, you'll oh, see what's coming up. And you know what, Debussy, my mom died when I was 18, mm -hmm. it just hit me, mm -hmm. I, it was beautiful, the theme, with the, I'm, it makes me kind of want to cry now, but mm -hmm. it was so touching, Thank really you beautiful. Much. I hope you'll repeat these, actually my friend asked me to ask you. Are these going to be running again so that people who missed it the first on time film, will get to see on it? Film, yeah. You can see it on film at hersheyfelder.net. You just oh. go to myname.net and you can find all of these films. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, there are more questions. Uh, okay. I'll read some of them. Will he ever go live in Israel? How much does he entertain in Israel? Um, Israel has always been a fun question, you know. They always used to say to me when I was younger, Tavo, 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 Avalen <laughs> you know, But there's no money Those in the old days. And then later on, they mm -hmm. said, But the truth is, uh, most of my family lives in Israel. So going to Israel is really not a question in terms of I have so many friends who live in Israel. Entertaining in Israel, you know, if the opportunity comes up that it's a proper thing, there's absolutely. Thank you. Another question. Do you remember your first piano teacher? I do. Sure, of course. And that's Evelyn, uh, one of your mom's close friends. <laughs> Evelyn Winkler, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us more about uh, that. your first piano teacher. My first piano teacher. I just wrote about my first piano teacher. I wrote about my first piano teacher and her mom. I wrote about it on Facebook. If you go to my Facebook page, Hershey Felder, you'll find out about my first piano teacher and her mom, Hilda Teu, who I met in Miami of all places. But I was sent to, um, to study with Evelyn when I was 
very young. And I remember the first time I went into the lesson, I heard Beethoven Ferelis and I wanted to play it. And of course I couldn't because, you know, I had not played anything, but I was determined. And so I spent quite a while with Evelyn and, uh, and learned the basics. And that was wonderful. She was very dear. And I remember two piano in two places. It was in Cote St. Luke. One was upstairs. One, and then it was downstairs in the basement. And Evelyn had a dog named Fuzzy. I remember Fuzzy the dog. And were you a good student or you, you rebelled? You, no, it's not an terrible easy life to student. practice so much. <laughs> Too terrible student um, uh, in, the, in the early days. I wanted to, no, it wasn't that I was a terrible student. I always wanted to learn so much more than um, I was able to grasp at a very young age, but it took a while and then I started to get things and then I just, moved along. I think Evelyn went on to a professional life, you know, doing some other things other than piano. So I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have more questions. What did you think about the recent Yiddish version of Fiddler? In New York, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. done, by a lot of, done by a lot of my friends. I watched uh, some, I didn't, wasn't able to see the whole thing. It, I was performing at the same time they were, and we kept on trying to figure out times for me to go. And Zalman, who's a friend of mine, who is a music director. Yeah, he was, I think, yeah, because Joel Gray did the play. Zalman is, did the music, and we talked about when I was able to come down. I was so happy for them that it worked. I saw bits and pieces, snippets. It looked very, very moving, but I can't speak to the production because I didn't see it. But I can speak to the idea of it, which is absolutely so exciting and so wonderful and so thrilling. And I had some friends in it and some people, and it's just, you know, so wonderful that we're seeing this kind of resurgence and that it was so popular. Oh, was it still playing when, when they closed down this or it had already closed in New York? I don't know. I think they were about to tour. They were about ah, to come it, to LA it, it or so. But it already closed. Okay, yeah, all right, yeah. I think so. Okay, lots of lots of questions. I'm not sure if we can take them all, but. <laughs> it really happens with me, but go ahead. <laughs> what are you doing now other than Zoom performing? I don't Zoom perform. I only do make movies and do live performances. In fact, we've never used Zoom. This is Zoom for this kind of thing that we're doing is fine. The, mm -hmm. uh, the big projects are big, heavy duty film live projects. So they're broadcast projects. So we don't use Zoom. We, do, we use broadcast. Um, and uh, what am I doing other? Well, I'm restoring parts of the house that I live in because it's 900 years old. So there's that, but I don't have much time to do that. Uh, I am working with a number of creative people in, in Italy about developing the company that I have here in various other directions. Um, I'm continuing with my fundraising efforts in order to help theaters and artists and giving away as much money as possible mm. to artists all over the country and helping students and so on and so forth. I'm just, I'm just continuing on. It's, you know, we can't say that it is stabilized because we don't know, you know, but I'm doing whatever it is I can just to continue. That's it. I mean, what else? Mm -hmm. right. And cooking, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cooking, but the trouble is, you know, uh, I don't know how people are behaving in America, but we're we're very we're quite careful here. So mm -hmm. you know, it's here was such a, such a great tragedy so fast, and because Italy is so um, elderly oriented, you know, it's all about family and all you know, and everybody goes to nonna for the weekend and so on and so forth. So many older people died so quickly that I think people got shocked and took it very seriously. And uh, we don't seem to have the same anger or problems that there are in America in terms of fighting against behaving properly, so to speak. And so um, we haven't had that many, yeah, I haven't had that many people to cook for. A few here and there, but, you know, uh, it's certainly not the parties that it's been in the old days. So my cooking skills have you know, got, not gone down, but have been on, on hold, which is a good thing because otherwise, you know, in, in Italy, my God, the food is so good that, you know, soon I'm going to have to do Rossini. It'll be the only costume I could fit in. So you know, it was big. Wow. All right. More questions. How many languages do you speak fluently? English, French, Yiddish, Hebrew, Italian. I have all the filthy words in Polish. I will tell you. <laughs> These are good ones. Tell us, tell us. 
and also really, really <laughs> dirty ones, dirty ones that my grandmother taught me in Hungarian, and I have a bit of Russian, but really my my and German. So my languages are really six: English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew are fluent, fluent, um, uh, and uh, Italian and German are very good. Great. Oh, and uh, if, um, I think. Mike, if you can uh, share your news, because I got a private message from you, but maybe people want to hear from you also. And um, somebody wants to say hi to you also. So if people want to unmute themselves now, they can. That's the well, time. I, no, I want to say hi to her. Ah, look who this <laughs> is. It's my buddy. Look how good you look. Are you taking sun lately? You look <laughs> no, I'm, my, my vitamin is my wife. See on ah. Vitamin. Well, we love her so much. Siona is amazing. She, she keeps me young. Hashi, you look fabulous. I mean, every time I see you and listen to you, it, it gives me so much nachas mm. uh, because we've known each other a long time. But uh, yeah. you have done uh, something so unique and such a contribution to our culture and to our language uh, and to our art and uh, the support you give to the community and um, to our fellow artists who are suffering greatly now uh, is so important. And uh, just wanted to tell you that when I heard that you're gonna be interviewed, uh, I said, I have to be here. It's early here in Los Angeles, so it's great. And I uh, just wanted to mention that Hershey was gracious enough to be one of my guests on, I have a, uh, like, like Hershey, you know, we're sitting at home, we didn't have what to do. So I created a, uh, a YouTube channel and I just schmooze with my friends and mm -hmm. she was one really? of the first. So if you want to see Hershey again, uh, we have a lovely schmooze on my channel. It's Mike Burston and friends. And we're preparing for Purim. We, speaking of Yiddish, we just did the Dibbuk in Yiddish, mm. the wonderful uh, Yiddish broadcast last month of the Dibbuk on, on a, web, a webinar with wonderful performers from all over the world. And we're doing the Megillah of Itzik Manger for Purim. So, How fun uh, is that? Oh, wow. Not, not, not the musical, not the musical. No, no, no. Where can you find, where can you find the, uh, the Dybbuk? Uh, it's going to be the uh, Congress for Jewish Culture. Uh -huh. uh, it's on their website. Uh -huh. uh, it's wonderful. And uh, the end of February, just before Purim, we will be uh, doing the same thing with the Congress of Jewish Culture. Uh, Itzik Manger's uh, Megillah leader from his poems right. in Yiddish with English. Uh, we did it on Broadway many years ago. Sure. But uh, if you like Yiddish, I think you'll enjoy that. And I uh, just want to send you our love. Tsiona's next to me. Uh, where is she? Tsiona. No, she, doesn't want, she, won't, she doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> it's it's Shabbat's morning and she's in her bathrobe. So <laughs> no, 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 I have to tell I oh Siona and I met. We can share this with everybody. Siona, do you remember where we met? Oh, she was telling me. She was telling yes. me. Siona and I met at Steven Spielberg's mother's Milchig restaurant in Los Angeles. We went, she was Siona was friends with, with Steven's mother, and I was friends with Steven's mother. And this is the first time we met. It must be almost 30 years ago or something. If not more. Oh, get it. Yeah. It's before it's before Mike, I even think. Oh it's yeah, BM. Oh yeah, BM. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so wonderful to see you guys. Big hug. Love you, and we'll Love you. We'll, and see. we're we're gonna mute myself so we can keep listening to your wonderful stories. Kola kavod. And stay Kola safe. Kola. Please stay safe. I will. You too. Thank you. Thank you. If other people want to unmute themselves, I think we have one more person, right? problem with connection. Evelyn, do you want to uh, tell us something or so? Here she, mm -hmm. do you hear me? It's Evelyn Winkler. Oh no, my goodness. How do you, I <laughs> have there. Many years. I see your chin. I don't, that's it. There we are. <laughs> my my <laughs> piano teacher from when I was a boy. Now, how do you come to this? How would you even find I don't here? know. I noticed it in one of the, one of the uh, advertising on Facebook, uh -huh. and I said, I have to see him. How fun is that? Where do you live now? Still Montreal, Cotain Luke. Still Montreal. See, I, do you remember? I remember Fuzzy the dog very well. Isn't Fuzzy. that amazing? Your and dad I mean, is still is still in, in Montreal? 
my dad is still there. He's 92 years old. He's uh, not from you, I'm sure. But I hope you guys are being safe. But Evelyn was the first person who taught me scales, and she was a friend of my mom. Remember the duets we used to play? We used to play the duets. duets. Absolutely. And so if. And if, then you if, became better than me. <laughs> well, Much the, better. If, well, the thing is, what you have to know is if, if all of you are, are don't like what I do, here's a lady, you can blame her. I, <laughs> I <have nothing. laughs> well, it's lovely to see you, Evelyn, and it's wonderful. Lovely, and okay. it's, be well, be you well, too. and safe. if you ever come to Montreal, we live I, in the same building, I think, that your dad lived in. Oh, wonderful. I actually came because I directed The Pianist of Wilsdon Lane last year, two years ago, something like this. I don't even remember when anymore. Um, I brought it to the Bronfman Center and it was there. So uh, wonderful. Uh, I had been there just for a, a few days. But anyway, it's wonderful to see you. Big hugs. Many years. Big hugs. Oh, regards from George. Oh, hello, George. We haven't seen each other in 40. Hey, George. Hi. Hey, nice hi, to see hi, you. Hi. I remember you with a mustache. Where's the mustache? I had, I had a mustache, I had a beard, I had, we went through everything. You went through everything. He's remember. also your Magyar connect, connection. I remember your George, George was the Hungarian, wonderful. Well, it's so good to see you guys again. It's that, probably 40 years since I haven't seen you. Oh my that. God. Listen, listen, Evelyn and your mother were best of friends. I remember, that's how I came to you to begin with. As a matter Listen. of fact, if you show them the piano. No, no, no. <laughs> I it's still have a piano, but I'm not playing. It's wonderful. Be well, stay safe. Thank you, thank you guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Yes, interesting, <laughs> interesting guests we have today for sure. <laughs> uh, no, uh, somebody's asking how people can get tickets for your Shalom Aleichem show, how long it That's is. Very easy. Uh, how long it is, uh, I don't know yet. It's under two hours, but uh -huh, we uh -huh. start pre shooting next week. Um, and uh, we start, let me see, uh, yeah, next Monday. And then we have the mm -hmm. live airing on the 7th of February. And this is a whole thing because who knew? I mean, I did know, but that's what was the inspiration for this. And Mike, I know you know this too, that he lived in Nervi in Italy, just, for, just around the corner for four years. That's where he actually spent four winters of his life was here in Italy on the Riviera. So we're going to film a whole ton of stuff in, in Nervi, which will be fun exactly on the spot where he used to write, exactly on the place where he lived. So I've been able to do that. And that part has been fun. I did that with Tchaikovsky as well. Tchaikovsky lived in Florence too. So, you know, eventually everybody passed through here. So I get to, I get to film where they actually went. So um, it will be a fun story and how I'm dealing with it is also fun. I won't give it away, but it's fun. Okay, uh, we shared the link in the chat. If people want to get tickets, they can get it here. Um, and one more question. Do you know any Yiddish speakers in San Diego? Hmm. Do I know any Yiddish speakers in San Diego? Well, not people that I've communicated with regularly, but I have had mm -hmm. people that that speak to me in Yiddish and they hear that I speak Yiddish, they speak Yiddish. There are a few people from a few different schools that sometimes speak Yiddish. But the interesting thing about, about America, uh, and that is, is that the Yiddish speakers were less than where I grew up in terms of my knowing them. Because where I grew up, I grew up with a community, everybody spoke Yiddish. It's just, it was Montreal. Mm -hmm. Everybody spoke Yiddish. And when America shut its doors, you know, uh, Canada still had its doors open. So, so many of those immigrants were able to come from Poland, from Hungary, speaking Yiddish, that to me, Yiddish is a language I grew up in. Yiddish is not something that was my grandparents' language or some other language or something. It's the language I grew up in and English and French and Hebrew was the language that we learned, you know, elsewhere. So I grew up in that environment. I mean, you when you went to the bakery for Shabbos to go buy your... You know, if you were Hungarian, you went to buy your barches, which is, this is not even a word, but in Yiddish, Hungarian Yiddish, it's barches, you know. Um, and so you went to buy your challah for Shabbos, that's what you went to Hungarian bakery, and everybody was Hungarian, everybody was Yiddish, and everybody spoke that. I mean, I grew up thinking most foods actually had Yiddish names. I didn't know that they actually had English names, you know, um, and, and, and Hungarian names as well. So it's quite funny. 
Well, our time is almost up. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. One more question we can answer. Are you okay. planning to come to the San Diego rep this spring? No. Who knows? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's, I, I'm, I scheduled to open a enough there, but we're not, of course. You know, there is, there is nothing that is going to be live uh, this coming spring. We don't even know this new strain is a scary affair. And I think, you know, living here in Italy and you know the inter I want to point this out as as a as a thought maybe it's a thought to leave you with in this past couple of years I've played Gershwin I've played uh, I'm playing Rachmaninoff so it's a and there's a point to this um this coming and then Debussy and Irving Berlin those four those four cross the 1918 well Debussy died at that day but they crossed the 1918 pandemic I can safely say that about those four characters. I know everything there is to know because I've spent my time studying them. And it's an amazing, amazing concept to know their biographies and not in one biography is the 1918 pandemic mentioned. Not one, not even a mention, not even this happened. Not So I think this happens, it killed 50 million people. That's a lot. Something that happens and then the world gets through it and the world moves on. It's a great tragedy and we will get through it. We will move on. But it, it was a staggering thing to me to when I did the Irving Berlin show in May, I asked Irving's daughter, Mary Ellen, I said, well, you know, I never read about it, I never heard about it, but was he touched by the pandemic in 1918? And she said, oh yes, and I remember. I said, what do you remember? Because I've never seen it in a book. And she said, my mother told me that my father was at Camp Upton and he was doing a show and they had to take him out of the show in New York because he got very sick because everybody in the camp got sick. Camp Upton was a uh, army camp. Everybody got sick and they took him home to New York and he was bedridden for six months. And I said, why isn't this written about it? And he almost died. I said, why isn't this written about anywhere? She said, because it happened and then it was over. And it was, it, you know, if it didn't stop anything, your life per se, it, you went on. And I think that's what's going to happen here. It will be a while before it happens. But in five years from now, we will remember it as those terrible two years but I think people will move on and be grateful to move on. And I live in a place where it happened in 1348, I think, was it 1348, the plague, you know? And the Decameron came out of, out of Boccaccio's Decameron, came out of, um, you know, the plague here, walking and staying. And in fact, the house that I live in is a house where people escaped the plague in the city. And we know that. So, you know, uh, the world will get through it. It's going to be hard and it's very tragic, but we will get through it and hopefully come out okay on the other end. Yes, yes. From your mouth to God's ears, <laughs> as we say in Yiddish. And thank you. Thank you very much for finding time for us. Thank Next you. time, Mirvelen dos ton take of Yiddish. Yeah? <laughs> no problem. Oif Yiddish. Oif Yiddish. All right. All right. All right. And Zayme then, Zayme to everybody, and I will speak to you soon again. I hope. Thank you. We post in chat the link to our website. If some of you who don't know Yiddish yet want to be Yiddishized, and uh, that's that's where they should go to find all kinds of levels of Yiddish classes. And uh, we also shared the link to our donation campaign because we want to build the International House of Yiddish here in San Diego. I think San Diego deserves uh, such an institution where we could and also share also share Mike's Mike's you know uh, shows. If you can share Mike's shows. Oh yes, Mike. If you could put it in the chat, the link. That I'm sure people would be very yes, interested. Yes, I will. Okay, I'll put it in the chat. Uh, awesome, was... awesome. Daimir Gizund, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Sending love from Florence. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Love you. Bye. Ich grüße und Dank und let's stay in touch. A schönen Dank euch. Thank you. Seid <laughs> gesund und stark. Seid gesund. Thank you, Jana. It was excellent. See you soon. Thank you, everybody, again. Heizigen Dank. Angreifen Dank. Bis bald. <laughs> Bis bald, ja. Yeah.